From surviving to thriving, for many, the toughest leadership test is ahead. How to bring business back to a high growth path in an uncertain environment as the COVID pandemic continues to rage on across the world. The global economy continues to reel from the impact. After a massive contraction, the Indian economy is now showing signs of a recovery as business activity picks up and restrictions are removed. But the quality and sustainability of the recovery is still in question. Businesses are learning to adapt to the new normal and the focus is now on ensuring business continuity driven in large measure by leveraging technology. But for some sectors, the return to normalcy will be a long winding road. The travel and hospitality industry continues to be vulnerable. SMEs are still grappling with disruption caused by the lockdown. Businesses are hoping that the demand revival is sustainable even as they seek more stimulus from the government. The government is hoping to use this crisis as an opportunity to pitch India as an alternative to China and has announced schemes to draw in investments. Recent global geopolitical shifts, a further retreat from globalization, the rise of economic nationalism coupled with the advance and acceleration of tech adoption will change the world as we know it today. Hello and welcome to The Making with me, Shireen Bhan, a special show where we speak to business leaders from across sectors to understand how they are navigating a post-pandemic world. We'll try and give you a bird's eye view of the changes that the world is grappling with. On this series, we'll take a look at how industries are getting smarter, while why Indian MSMEs need to go global, the reshaping of global supply chains and much more. Well, today on our inaugural episode, we have a very special guest, Surendra Rosha, the CEO of HSBC India. He's been associated with the bank for about 27 years, both in India and Hong Kong, and has worked in multiple roles in forex trading, corporate treasury, and capital markets across a variety of countries. Rosha, thanks very much for joining us here as we launch this very special series talking about India at a crossroads. But before we get talking, let's go across to my colleague Ritu for a quick snapshot of how India's macros stack up. After the initial shock of the pandemic and the resultant lockdown-induced economic hit, India has enjoyed better news flow on both the health and economic front. Yes, India has the dubious distinction of being one of the three countries to have crossed that one lakh death mark because of COVID-19. But the good news is active cases have seen the biggest drop yet in recent few days and deaths have also fallen off peaks. Recovery rates have also accelerated. So where do we stand on the growth front at this point? Well, the first quarter numbers were a complete shocker, the lowest growth that India has seen in decades. But GDP growth, if you see, has actually been falling for the last three years now. RBI, for instance, expects the Indian economy to contract by 9.5% in this financial year, with various other agencies forecasting a contraction of anywhere between 11.8 to 9%. But the good news is RBI expects this to reverse as early as the third quarter of this fiscal. So what is the financial sector credit and deposit growth data telling us? Credit is nothing but a reflection of the economy, and that has been languishing at about 5% levels. Deposit growth, on the other hand, has increased since March, and has far outpaced credit growth since September of this year. And this widening gap is nothing uh, but a reflection of an increase in risk aversion by banks. But there are also green shoots of recovery, although it is early days yet. To begin with, unemployment rate has fallen from a high of 23.5% in April to almost 7% uh, in the month of October. And in what is an undisputed sign of recovery, September GST collections actually crossed the 1 lakh crore mark for the first time in this financial year. Uh, the IIP in September also recorded a flattish growth of 0.2% after six consecutive months of contraction. India's manufacturing PMI also surged to its highest level in almost a decade. Electricity consumption has also been rising and e-way bills, uh, the issuance recorded a 21.4% increase over last year. The government has also announced a series of second set of stimulus measures, 12 in total, to boost economic activity. For instance, a production-linked incentive scheme for 10 sectors to make India a significant manufacturing destination. Other measures like expanding the scope of the 3 lakh crore uh, emergency credit line to include 26 stress sectors and healthcare, income tax relief for home buyers and developers of residential units, and also an employee's provident fund subsidy to spur job creation. Now, all of these put together indicate that perhaps the economy will get back on its feet faster than initially anticipated. Rosha, many thanks for joining us here on uh, The Making. Let me start by talking to you about how you personally managed to navigate through this crisis. Uh, you know, the lockdown, 
uh, the overnight dislocation, disruption. Uh, what, was, what was that initial period for you like? Thanks, Shireen. Thank you for having me. Uh, see, I think uh, one of the advantages we had as a global firm was being able to learn from some of the other countries that had been impacted before India. So we did have a, uh, what I'd call a bit of a playbook mm. that we could adapt. So we actually are 40,000 of us across all our entities in India. And we decided to move to a work from home environment around the 16th of March mm. in, a, in a staggered fashion. But as we got to the end of that week, we really had to accelerate the movement. Mm. And, and you know the following week we were in a lockdown, but by then about 90% of our staff had moved to a work from home environment. The big challenges we had in the short term were moving our customers who were used to interfacing with us in a, in a physical format, be it in trade finance mm. or in the retail bank or in other parts of our operations to interacting with us in a digital way. And that was probably to my mind the biggest challenge we faced as we exited March and entered April. Along with the fact that we were trying to get a lot more laptops to our people, <laughs> desktops to our people, so those logistics challenges that we had to deal with moving equipment to people's houses. But once you got past that, I think it's been pretty smooth sailing uh, from, from a banking perspective mm. and for us at HSBC. You know, what, what has really been exciting for us is the fact that our, our team in India, 36,000 of them support our global operations and our global technology mm. requirements. They've been able to operate without a break in service mm. for the last seven months despite largely operating from home. Even today we are at about 85% work from home and our support operations continue to do an outstanding job. So okay. it's been a great learning experience in the resilience of, uh, of Indian service industry that, that we provide to global companies. Since you talked about how 85% of the workforce for you at HSBC in India continues to be working from home, do you believe that this is going to have to be the new normal in the foreseeable future? Uh, do you believe that we are going to move to much more dynamic, flexible, uh, you know, hub and spoke models for organizations? I mean, as you look ahead, uh, even if there is a vaccine uh, that we hope we will have one by the start of next year. But what do you believe is likely to be the future of the way that we work? Yeah, look, I, I think the, uh, the new way of working, as I see it in the post-pandemic world, will be very different from what we had before March of this year or what we are going through even now. I think there will be an element, a large element of the workforce that will work from home or in some form have flexi working arrangements, mm. which may mean that they're in office for one or two days a week and they work from home for the balance. And part of that has to do with the fact of the nature of the roles that they do. But equally, you know, people spend a lot of time in our, in our urban environment traveling back and forth mm. from work. Some of my colleagues spend up to three hours a day on the roads in Mumbai. So is it better for them to be given that alternative and working from home to an extent possible. Mm. That certainly is something to consider. And the other aspect that one must keep in mind though is that there's an immense amount of social capital that builds up yeah. in a team mm. when they physically interact with each mm. other in the workplace. So we don't want to lose that either. You know, one of the reasons why many of us have been successful in going through the pandemic and dealing with uh, keeping our operations resilient and keeping the shop open mm is because teams know each other, they trust each other, they've been able to operate. As we bring in new people to our organization, we need to ensure that they carry the same conduct and culture ethos as the rest. And, and therefore, it's quite important to balance the work from home with the work from office. So my own sense is that you know, if we were maybe 100 people in the office on an average day in 2019, mm. for the same workforce, we'll probably be 70 people in the office on an average day in 2021 or 2022. Okay. Uh, so that's the scale of change that I that's see. That's the which scale is of the change that you anticipate. And you're right, we will have to uh, look at what is the best way forward in terms of that balance and social capital, as you point out, uh, is crucial uh, for teams to be able to work together. But Rosha, let's talk now about India. Uh, we're coming off a fairly 
steep contraction of uh, almost 24 percent. There are green shoots that are visible. The question though is how sustainable, how long lasting will this be? What's your own assessment of where the Indian economy currently stands and finds itself? So, uh, well, I'll share my personal assessment mm -hmm. and that of my economist. So my economist is looking at an 11 percent contraction in this fiscal followed by close to 8 percent growth in 21-22. My own sense though personally is that as I look at data that's coming out, mm -hmm. a lot of this will really depend on how deep or how intense is it if we get a second wave, is that second wave? Because that's going to really determine the sustainability of the green shoots that you talked about that we are seeing currently. If we are able to manage the second wave well, I think that actually growth in FY 2021 could be so in this minus 9 to 10 percent area and that would set us up really well mm. in FY 21-22 to play catch up. I think the critical elements are in place. We were moving on policy even before the pandemic. If you recollect the, the change in corporate tax rates uh, made India an attractive destination. Uh, the, the trade war conversation that was happening globally meant that corporates were reviewing their supply chains even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That has picked up impetus. India has come out with policy reform to, to try to make its case to be part of global supply chains. I think it's a very strong case. And if we are able to sustain our, our policy direction in the next 18, 24 months, we should be very well positioned to capture the movement of supply chains in certain sectors. Mm -hmm as I see it. Uh, you talked about countries like Vietnam, uh, you know, where we have seen a little bit of this China plus one strategy play itself out. Uh, in light of all the measures that have already been taken by, by India, what more do you believe will need to be done to enhance our competitiveness? Is there anything specific that you believe remains on the unfinished agenda that requires to be taken forward? I, look, I think there are two areas that uh, I would call out. One is uh, uh, infrastructure, and particularly a, a scaling up of infrastructure around our, our ports and the logistics areas. I think that can really help us become part of that global supply chain on scale, because if the government shows intent to develop these, companies will follow. I think the ability to to manufacture quickly remains in India, but the ability to get your goods out yeah. quickly is something that we need to be able to solve for. And if we are able to do that, I think that will really help the case. The second point I would make is in, in just more broadly in terms of availability of private sector capital. Uh, that is something that the pandemic has challenged, and therefore we will need to attract international capital into our debt markets into uh, into uh, private equity in, in a greater manner to sustain some of our enterprise requirements. Mm -hmm. So I think these two areas, you know, whether that debt capital comes through banks, which are uh, which are operating to a certain level of restriction because of capital as well, or it comes through the bond markets, is to be seen. But I think if we can sort out infrastructure and if we can uh, make sure that adequate uh, capital is available to industry, we should mm -hmm. be in a good spot. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, on the issue of capital, and we have seen record inflows, especially on the private equity side. We've seen a lot of control deals take place here in India as well, uh, driven by private equity. Rosha, uh, do you see that as being sustainable? We're also living in an era of cheap money. There's abundant liquidity sloshing around in the world. Central banks continue to be highly accommodative. Uh, so do you believe that flows will continue to come into India? Uh, and uh, do you believe that this exercise of, uh, of uh, fundraising, you know, we've seen a whole bunch of banks in India beef up their balance sheets. Is that likely to continue to be a trend uh, going into the next year? Yes, yeah, so I think on, on foreign appetite or foreign capital appetite for India, it's certainly very strong. And it was actually even a year back yeah. in my uh, conversations with investors, was actually India was in the top three, top four sort of destinations for, for anybody I spoke with globally. So, so it was clearly in place even before this. And I think the, the changes that have happened through the pandemic have, have uh, further enhanced that. I think India offers a couple of unique opportunities. Mm. Uh, there are assets 
available at relatively cheap valuations. People have not seen these valuations in India in certain areas. The second aspect I would say is the scale that India offers is, is unique in terms of very few markets offer you that. So I think these two aspects do play to our strength. Mm. I do believe firmly that for the next three years with yields remaining low for a long period of time with central banks as you said remaining accommodative with fiscal policy continuing to be accommodative as well we will see capital available for us for the right transactions uh, I, I would add though that I think it's really important that the reform trajectory that has been set in mm -hmm. place continue because that sentiment positivity will also play a big role Yes, that certainly will play a big role. But let me now focus uh, on banks and banking, Rosha. Uh, and of course, one of the interesting things that uh, that we've seen play itself out through the course of the pandemic is the digital acceleration as well as the digital adoption, uh, you know, UPI transactions crossing 200 crore, etc. But I'll get to that in a second. Let me talk to you about the outlook as far as the sector itself is concerned. Uh, do you believe that we are on the cusp of seeing a revival as far as credit offtake is concerned, which, is, uh, which continues to be constructed? strained so far? I think uh, my, my own sense is that we are about a quarter away from seeing an off, uh, a improvement in credit offtake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's still banks are ready. They've, uh, you know, a lot of us have sanctioned loans, but, but the offtake hasn't been as much as uh, one would have liked. I think that if the green shoots we are seeing continue to play out, we don't have a, a significant second wave of the pandemic we should be in a far better spot as we go into Q4 of this fiscal mm -hmm. in terms of credit offtake. I think uh, my sense is that we will be surprised on the upside in that process. Uh, one of the reasons why perhaps credit offtake has been muted so far is because a number of people have raised capital mm -hmm. and they have deployed that into their businesses ahead of uh, drawing on, on mm -hmm. loans. So I think you will see some of this come, out, come through in the next three, four months okay. in my view. The question really is whether the banking sector is adequately positioned mm. and that's where some of the challenges will be because many banks remain uh, capital constrained uh, and, and that needs to be addressed uh, you know, in the medium term as, as the sector moves on. You know, Rosha, let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of banking. Uh, digital banking is not new. Uh, the pace has only accelerated courtesy the pandemic and courtesy the lockdown. Uh, but, you know, we've in the past also seen premature obituaries being written about cash, uh, about physical banking, about bank branches. Uh, what's your own take on what, what banking could look like uh, post this? So I think uh, we were on a trend of digitization of banking services even before, again, the pandemic started. I think India had put in place a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, digital stack that effectively democratized banking services you know, uh, banks could plug and play and, and deliver services to their customers at fairly low cost options. And I think that was the direction of travel. What the pandemic has done is crunched it substantially. My own view is if I think about, uh, let's take branch banking. Yes, branches around the world are being re-looked at, not just in India in terms of, uh, you know, do we have too many yeah. uh, in uh, in our operations, etc. But, But I think for for certain life events, customers will continue to come into the branch. Mm. When you want to do uh, estate planning, when you want to do your insurance, for life insurance, or when you want to do certain large decisions on your wealth portfolio mm. or on loans, etc., or mortgages, people will come into the branch. Mm. But that is v a, a small sliver of what customers do on a day-to-day -day basis when they interface with the uh, with a banking organization. And a large part of that balance is moving into a digital world. And, you know, it's not just about being on a mobile or being on the internet to, to, to transact, but it's equally from a self-serve standpoint. Increasingly, customers don't want to talk to a, uh, to a call center mm. on a problem. They want to be able to interact with, with the bank through their mobile app or through the internet platform and solve for themselves on queries that they may have or on requests that they're putting in, etc. Mm. So I think that's the sort of trend that I see happening where a large part of banking will be digital, 95, 97% of it, but some of the large value stuff will remain in the physical world. Secondly, 
a lot of what customers interface with us on, on queries will move to a much more of a self-serve environment versus one where you need somebody on the other end answering the customer. And, and look, on the wholesale side, we've seen this change. You know, we, uh, we are a large trade finance bank. Mm. We used to do about 13% of our trade in, in digital format or in, uh, in a non-physical format in 2018. Uh, today, we are close to 70, 72%. So that shift is tremendous in an area like trade finance, which is full of uh, you know, documentation, bills of lading, uh, letters of credit, et cetera. So, so if, if that's a business that's moved so far ahead in digital, I'm, I see a lot more happening even in other parts of banking. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is that then going to mean in terms of investments, uh, making digital bets? How much of your time uh, as the head of the bank here in India is spent now on making decisions that otherwise perhaps uh, you know, a CTO would have looked at. Is this now, uh, you know, this uh, a priority as far as the corner office is concerned, the top leadership is concerned? I think it's a huge priority. You know, a uh, couple of years back, if you'd asked me the question, I'd say customers and the staff are the center of everything that I do. Uh, today, it is customer, staff, and technology. So it's, it's become a huge priority for us uh, as a as a leadership team in the bank, and I'm sure for my peers across the sector. Mm. Because it's not just about where we are positioned today. You have to be thinking three years, five years ahead, because there's so much emerging capability. And India is so rich with, uh, with innovation in the financial services space that we can really adapt that quickly. And in many ways, we could build in India as a global organization to export to the world some of these capabilities. Is, is any of that innovation being done here at HSBC in India that's being exported outside? We, we are looking at uh, you know, specific uh, things like data analytics to drive a customer activity. Mm. We are looking at bringing together product lines into a uniform uh, or a uni uh, you know, unified uh, experience for our customers in transacting with us. Mm. So these are some of the areas where we are innovating for the first time within our group globally and hoping to take some of that uh, learning and development to other uh, geographies in HSBC. Uh, you know, Rosha, you talked about trade finance and how that is a focus area uh, for the bank. Uh, uh, as we look at the geopolitical shifts that are taking place, uh, as we look at the reshaping of trade relationships, uh, the rise of economic nationalism, what do you believe it is going to mean in terms of trade and trade finance specifically? So we, we have seen a, uh, a drop in, in global mm. trade as a result of partly because of what's happened in terms of uh, the, the geopolitical environment and then because of the pandemic. But uh, fundamentally, I think, uh, you know, every government that we talk to is committed to being in, a, in an open economy environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is conversations, whether you call it economic nationalism or self-reliance of, of, uh, of uh, national production capability, but it doesn't mean that people are, are not going to be trading with each other. We continue to see a lot of conversations going on across the globe for bilateral trading arrangements, uh, you know, as the UK exits uh, later this year, early next year from mm. the European Union. They are, they are arranging for, uh, for trade agreements with a number of countries. Uh, you know, India itself is reviewing its trade agreements. So I think there will be a reshaping of trade, but fundamentally the, the intent of, of uh, producing in, and, and moving goods across borders has not diminished to my mind. Mm -hmm. And equally, Shireen, I think this applies to services as well. You know, we will see services trade, which is also very important, uh, get challenged as people look closely at data mm. and data privacy and data localization mm. and such aspects. But once you get past that, once you get to a, a level of uniform principles that hopefully will be arrived at, then uh, I think, again, uh, you are going to be looking at efficiency coming through in the way you, pr you consume services as an organization or as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, you're, so you're right. Hopeful. 
You're right about that. Data, of course, is going to be a crucial part of this reshaping, global reshaping uh, that we're speaking of. Uh, but Rosha, let me ask you about the key risks that you believe you're going to be watching out for. I mean, what's flashing on your dashboard today? What are the red flags flashing on your dashboard? Look, I think what's happening currently in Europe and the US in terms of the second wave is clearly the most immediate concern because, you know, we, we just need to make sure that we are watching that and learning to the extent possible to avoid that, uh, that sort of a situation. I think a second, a second lockdown in India of any sort would be very tough because uh, that, that would mean that as we are just seeing the recovery mm. and the change in sentiment, it would hurt us uh, dramatically. Uh, the second thing that I, I certainly do look out for, and this is perhaps a little more medium term, is is disruptive technology not necessarily being uh, being you know sort of innovated by my peers, but but what's happening in the sort of fintech world and how do we collaborate with with that emerging technology to deliver better services? Because mm -hmm. that can be a a challenge to our business model, but it uh, it can also be a key enabler. Mm. The third thing I'd say is in the context of the reform process and, and some of the policies that have been put in place, you know, to ensure, I mean, and to watch that that is implemented in a consistent manner. One of the challenges we hear from, from many global companies when it comes to dealing with India is the sort of sense they have of uh, policy shifts that mm. happen from time mm -hmm. to time. Mm. You know, if they get a sense that these reforms that have been put in place around factors of production, et cetera, are there for the long term, mm. and it signals a, a material shift in, in policy, I think that it will have a cascading effect on, uh, on sentiment for it towards India. So I'd say these three things really. One is the immediate in terms of the pandemic and how it's evolving. Yeah. The second is technology, and the third is uh, the sustainability of the reform process. Uh, you're right about the last one. I think policy predictability has been an issue that foreign investors and domestic investors both have uh, raised when it comes to uh, the ease of doing business in India. And I would imagine that uh, this message continues to go out to uh, the government as well as other regulatory agencies that policy predictability is the order of the day, especially if we want to capitalize on the current opportunity. But on the second point, Rosha, uh, and you spoke about that, the, the fintech advantage, so to speak, and how you can better collaborate, converge with that world. Uh, is, is there a likelihood of deeper collaboration, perhaps even uh, uh, M&A there, as far as you're concerned? I mean, there's a whole bunch of Indian startups doing some fairly exciting work there. Yeah, there is, uh, there is some really exciting stuff going on, and we learn a lot. You know, I learn in every interaction personally that I have with them. Uh, look, I think uh, M&A, in a way, is, is always a possibility, but, but the fact is that, you know, I, uh, I would prefer this to be something of a business collaboration mm -hmm. rather than uh, the traditional sort of M&A outcome because uh, my experience, you know, being in a large organization like HSBC is you bring a, a, a capability that, that has thrived because of it being developed in, in, in an agile, nimble environment into a larger organization and you may not necessarily get the same outcomes mm -hmm. in terms of innovation, et cetera, that you would like. So my own sense is that we will look to collaborate, bring these capabilities in, partner, be part of their ecosystem mm. uh, in this process. And it will mean that we may, you know, we may have some failures and we'll have successes. And as long as you're able to ride those successes uh, to, towards what your, uh, your goal was, I think you'll be far more successful in trying that out. But you have to be ready to fail, mm. which I think is a big mind change for many traditional bankers because you know typically we were we are so process driven we want to get the right outcome to yeah. be uh, to be the only mm. outcome Rosha, private investment, and uh, you know, it hasn't been a COVID story in India. It uh, dates back to the pre-COVID time as well, and we haven't seen private investment pick up. Uh, and the expectation was that with the cut in interest rates, with the cut in corporate taxes, and so on and so forth, there will be a demand stimulus, uh, and we will start to see greenfield projects picking up, private investment picking up. Uh, where do you believe things currently stand on that curve and specifically on the interest rate curve as well do you believe that there is much more headroom uh, for rates to be cut 
So let me take the second bit first. I think we, we probably will see one more rate cut, but I, I don't think we'll see much more than that. Uh, my, is my sense. We, what we will though see is that the, the Reserve Bank from a monetary policy standpoint will remain accommodative in my view. Mm -hmm. And that should ensure that, uh, that you know, beyond the policy rate, interest rates remain uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably benign. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a pushback up in yields uh, in, in certainly in this rest of this fiscal and early into next year. Uh, on, on the private investment side, Shireen, my own sense is that we will need the government to really take the lead and perhaps the infrastructure piece is, is critical to that, mm -hmm. you know, making some significant uh, commitments to build infrastructure could potentially spark uh, uh, optimism in the private sector to follow with, uh, with greater capital formation and, mm -hmm. and investment. My, my sense is that's the path that we will have to go down as a country, that the government will have to take the lead on infra, which is an area that we, are, we require. We require you know, any estimates between 100 to 150 billion yeah. a year of uh, dollars of infrastructure investment. And if the government takes the lead, I do think that will spark uh, significant activity in the private sector. Yes, I think uh, infrastructure development is the hope that the government is uh, uh, is placing its bets on as well, and uh, so is the private sector. But Rosha, before I let you go, uh, you know, since we're talking about navigating a post-pandemic world uh, and the adoption of technology, how much time are you now currently spending on your phone, on Zoom calls? I mean, what what is what is this period taught you personally? Personally, I think look, it's 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 taught me, you know, the that how much you can get done in the same day uh, by working through technology is phenomenal. So the amount of time that I was spending traveling from one meeting to the other or traveling from one city mm. to the other, that is going to change with uh, as we emerge from this pandemic. You know, you will make the call about using uh, Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever your platform mm. is to, to, to do that call or whether you should really be traveling and meeting in person. So that's one big change that's happened. And, and the second is, you know, I took, I took uh, for granted uh, being in the office, walking across to people's desk or, or walking the floor, et cetera. That, lev that ability to engage with your yeah. team and to, to interact, to get the, the sense from the body language, et cetera, that's been a big change because, you know, it's not that easy for me to figure out when you've got everybody on camera how yeah what the mood is like versus when you were walking the floor. Yes, absolutely. Uh, walking the floor has its own benefits. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we hope that uh, we, we're going to be able to return to, uh, to some degree of normalcy when it comes to things like that. But Rosha, it's been an absolute pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on the inaugural episode of The Making. And as I pointed out, over this series, we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of sectors and of course, try to connect the dots of what is likely to change and the implications of that change in a post-pandemic world. But with that it is time for us to wrap up this episode from all of us here on the team goodbye many thanks for watching